Good morning and welcome to IntelliJam, a weekly conversation with leaders in organizational intelligence and knowledge. I'm Tim Powell, president of the Knowledge Agency. Uh, we're very pleased this morning to have with us a guest of great international renown, uh, Mr. Guy St. Clair, the president and a consulting specialist at SMR International, which is a leading firm in the field of knowledge management and knowledge services. Welcome, Guy, and thanks for coming in to speak with us this morning. Thanks very much, Tim. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Uh, oh, I should also mention Guy teaches at the Columbia University uh, MS program in Knowledge and Information Strategy, a very innovative program, one of the, really the first of its kind uh, in the world. Now, you're known in a, as, a, as a pioneer in knowledge services, and we used to hear a lot about, since the last 15 years or 20 years even, about knowledge management. Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish and what's the difference between knowledge services and knowledge management? Is that just a new bottle for an old wine or is there something no. very different? That's really a good metaphor, Tim, and I'm glad you brought it up. Yes, I'm at the risk of being immodest. Uh, I am pretty well known as uh, s somewhat of an influence in knowledge services. In fact, uh, my, my signature on my email says, Guy St. Clair, President and Knowledge Services Evangelist. Uh, I'm very into knowledge services, which I'm going to define for you for a very specific reason. About 20 years ago, maybe 18 or so, we got into the whole subject of information of uh, intelligence of managing uh, uh, corporate assets of uh, 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 knowledge and intellectual capital as a corporate asset and uh, our great pal Tom Stewart was a great leader in that uh, he came up with a number of ideas about managing intellectual capital that soon became knowledge management and it went on that way for several years and we heard a lot of talk about knowledge management but what we actually heard about was people saying what's knowledge management you can't manage knowledge now as one of our good friends t uh, puts it you, you he's right you're right we cannot manage knowledge no more than we can manage piety and love and hope and all these sort of amorphous things but what we can do is work with knowledge and that, so, that, was, that was Larry Prusak, one of the great leaders in the field. And that kind of got me to thinking. And as I would go to work, in with client, work with clients, and as I would especially be pitching a project to senior management in an organization, I would have to spend the first 30 minutes or so explaining my version of knowledge management. And then one day, it sort of hit me. Managers and enterprise leaders can't get their arms around the concept of managing knowledge. What do they get their arms around? Why are they there? Why are they, ex they executives? Their job is to manage resources. And how do they do that? They're very aware of what they pay for, what they don't pay for, that sort of thing. Aha, what do they pay for? They pay for accounting services, legal services, catering services, even for heaven's sakes, they pay for uh, you know, uh, facility services, that sort of thing. It dawned on me that they're willing to pay for and be excited about what I started calling knowledge services. So does knowledge services add more value in some ways? It does indeed add more value, and, and that takes us to your work of yeah. the, the knowledge value chain and yeah. that sort of thing, because what we do with knowledge services, Tim, it's very clear to me and to many of the people that I work with nowadays, uh, and let me define it for you, because I think yeah. that'll make it a little bit yeah. easier for you and for, for our, our, our colleagues. Knowledge services, in my opinion, is the convergence of information management, which of course includes IT. The convergence of information management, what has been called knowledge management, that is working with knowledge, and strategic learning, how we share with each other. And the whole idea of knowledge services is that it, it builds a knowledge culture in the organization and there's your value piece, you see. It's adding value to the knowledge construct. We have a funny little acronym that we use. We call it knowledge development and knowledge sharing. 
KDKS. Yeah, it's a little silly, but it helps us remember what we're trying to say. And basically what we're trying to do is move into this value establishment for knowledge and information and strategic learning in the larger organization. We think about success in KDKS, knowledge development and knowledge sharing. Is this, uh, you used to hear a lot about knowledge management. There were magazines on knowledge yeah. management. We all used to get those and a whole sort of industry events, mm -hmm. uh, you know, happening all the time. And then it kind of died away. Mm -hmm. uh, so is knowledge services kind of the, re the rebirth with some new, uh, sort of a super category that's adding some new value? I think you might be onto something there, Tim. I had never thought about it in terms, I liked your, you know, new wine and an old, old bottle or new bottle for old wine. I like that one. But I also like the super category piece because I think when we stop and think about what we do with knowledge services, the whole KDKS thing, what we find is that knowledge services is the practical way to deal with knowledge management. In other words, it's how we put this, this construct of knowledge management to work in our organizations or in fact, and I talk about this a lot in my presentations and with my students, in our larger society. There, when I look around and think about how much more people know nowadays and how willing they are to not only develop knowledge that they can share with other people, but our society as a whole is, not to put too much pressure on us, our society as a whole is better off because we're more knowledgeable, because we're more transparent, we're more willing to share what we've developed with the people that we want to have that knowledge. Okay, now let's say that um, that's a general societal impact and all that, but let's say I'm a hard-headed Fortune 500 CEO. I got a report to Wall Street in a couple of weeks and my earnings are a little down and uh, you know, sales have been tough and, and all that. And uh, as a client actually came into my office about five years ago when the recession was starting to hit and he said, Tim, you know, it's, all, it's nice to talk about knowledge, but n how, you, how are you going to sell this during a recession? Mm -hmm. So I'm a Fortune 500 CFO and I'm saying, well, that's, that really sounds good, but specifically what are the benefits, what does it cost, what are we going to expect to receive, what's, you know, what's the ROI, the, okay. hateful, the hated yeah. ROI question? Not a, hated, not a hated ROI <laughs> question because I think about it all the time and we're dealing with a very special thing that's going on in, in the whole field of knowledge services now and that has to do with things like, and you can go look it up, things like online research analysis. How are we capturing what we learn or, and what we develop and then how are we sharing it. We now have the technology to ca capture that, the, the, those pieces, the, the data, and then analyze them. That's what analytics is all about. This is something that we haven't been doing before and, and yes, if I am a pioneer or an evangelist, if I'm out in front as far as knowledge services are concerned, I can tell you that there have been plenty of times when I've been with prospective clients and I've kind of sat there and squirmed in my seat because they're, saying, they're asking the very same question you just asked and I'd have to come up with some example and I'd say, well, your people are working better or there's more transparency or there are more people who are sharing and, and then once we got into social media, uh, you know, we got into talking about all that sort of thing. But the bottom line is, uh, or <laughs> the bottom line, not to make a pun, but the bottom line is the bottom line. Show me, Guy, how you and SMR are going to come into my company and demonstrate that it's worth our money and our time to put all these resources in having you do this study. You're going to do a knowledge audit. You're going to do uh, come up with recommendations. and. How is it going to benefit us? And that's the, the example I've started using is the ORA, ORA, the Online Research Analytics. But there are all sorts of things. Now, a lot of it continues to be anecdotal. I will in an information audit, I just had a student just, just this week who did an information audit and sat down and talked to 22 people in his organization, including a bunch of senior leaders. Now, what he found, which was a surprise to all of us, was that several of those senior leaders are aware of the fact that if they handle information knowledge, strategic learning, 
all well, information management, knowledge management, and strategic learning management, if they handle that all well, they're going to be in a better place financially. Is this a, an example where there might be some uh, problems that could be solved? One of the problems that you hear about a lot that I'm getting calls about, and uh, there's a lot of interest now in this issue of big data. Oh, yeah. And that big data, there's too much, there's sensors and transaction sensors yeah. everywhere, and it's creating so much data that we don't have the analytic, it, we've outgrown our analytical tools. Does knowledge services, how does knowledge services address Ooh, well, that? Well, uh, tough question, issue? tough question, because we we're, all, <laughs> we're all still playing with, with the whole, I mean, big data is what we've been talking about for what, a year, two years maybe, and it's, we're scared to death of it. And all the term big data does is just sort of give us a, a, a label or a tag for what we've been seeing going all the way back to the days of John Nesbitt saying, what, would something along the lines of, we're drowning in information, but we're starving for knowledge or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it was John Nesbitt uh, and Patricia Aberdeen. But uh, so w we've been thinking about it a long time. And of course, now when they tell us, as I heard uh, some uh, James Dalton from KPMG tell my students the other night, that each of us as a human being, was it? One gigabyte of, of, of stuff that we have on all our devices and that we do in one year, maybe it was 10 gigabytes, I don't know, whatever it was. But the, the image that he used, which had my students just gasping, was that what, what we deal with during a year, each individual, is the equivalent to 100,000 sheets of paper. Now, well, I, I have a little difficulty with that kind of imagery because just like I don't understand what a jillion dollars is. I mean, I have some difficulty with the imagery, but the point is, when we're talking about big data, there's a lot out there that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. With knowledge services, and we haven't yet talked about how knowledge services supports knowledge strategy in the larger organization, what we're doing is we're going in, we're analyzing, we're, we're synthesizing, we're trying to figure out with our colleagues how we handle that. Okay, here's another example that I might see as a knowledge-based problem. The pharmaceuticals industry, which some companies individually spend you know, upwards of $5 billion a year, like Pfizer, for example, on mm -hmm. R&D, mm -hmm. uh, Wall Street complains- Or a new product, $12 billion. That's a term uh, I've used. I don't know over if it's- Over a period of time. Over yeah, a period. For a new product a while, from, from concept to, to oh, rollout. Oh yeah, that's over a 10, you know, 10, $12 billion? 10, dollars? 10, I don't know period. what that means. <laughs> well, they, the, the reason they, 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 the drugs cost a lot of money to develop, but they put in a lot of money uh, into R&D and they're not getting yes. the, the blockbuster drugs out. There's something called a patent cliff. A lot of drugs came off patent and they need to find new drugs and R&D is a real problem. Some of these companies on Wall Street is saying, why aren't you guys, you're putting all this money in the top of this research pyramid and you're not getting money, you're not getting return out the bottom in mm -hmm. the form of new products. Is that, that may not be something you've addressed in your practice, but that is that theoretically a problem that knowledge services could address? You have this input-output model, you're getting all this R&D, all these scientists, yep. all this research, and you're not getting anything out the other end. Actually, like you Tim, used to. it is a problem that we address with knowledge services, and I'm going to give you an example. Uh, you might have heard me tell this story before because uh, uh, it's a story I like to tell from one of my clients. A big research organization, not a scientific, not a, a, a commercial firm, uh, but a, a, a large uh, a national research organization located in Washington, D.C., and in fact, they're not only, they were so concerned about the money that was going into research and development and projects, and they had a lot of programs, and their program officers were always coming up short. I mean, so, so the problems were such that they actually would have to, to sort of truncate some of their projects because they just ran out of money, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the people in the organization was, and, and I have so much respect for people in the specialized libraries community, one of the people who caught on to this in this larger organization was running the, the, the organization's uh, specialized research library. She came up with this idea. She said, you know what your problem is? Before you get into a project, before you take the decision to continue with that program, you don't analyze or even come up with estimates of what your research costs are going to be. Call us in. Let us put one of our research library technicians or managers or specialists 
and on your decision making so that when you're looking at a project that the scientists or the other researchers have come up with, you've got someone from my team standing, sitting there with you from the get-go saying, this is the kind of information and knowledge and strategic learning that you're going to be involved in. This is how much you're going to have to go looking for, and this is what it's going to cost. So we very think, important to get that concept yeah. in there that start up front yeah. with trying to figure out what the costs are going to be. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so my own training, as you know, is as an MBA. So I look at everything in terms of financial models, mm -hmm. and I look at portfolio models, like you have investments of stocks, bonds, and oil wells or whatever you have. Mm -hmm. And I look at knowledge as a portfolio of assets as well. And I talk about balancing the knowledge portfolio, just okay. as you would have to balance your personal portfolio mm -hmm. of investments. Maybe mm -hmm. every quarter you look at what do I need to do to sort of tune it up. Uh, I advocate doing that with companies, with our clients, every probably every quarter as well, but certainly every year to rebalance the knowledge portfolio. You mentioned your people doing sort of audits of the, what I would call the knowledge portfolio, sure. auditing the assets mm -hmm. or the inventory. Is that something then, again, that knowledge services can offer? Absolutely. In fact, one of the specialists of knowledge services, of, or one of the special activities of the whole uh, genre, you might say, has to do with what we call a knowledge audit, or you can call it an information audit, or you can call it a... Uh, a, a gaps analysis or a needs assessment. There are all kinds of things in all different fields that, mm -hmm. that, that uh, terms that we use for it. And basically what we go in and do as part of the knowledge services piece, this, I call it a knowledge audit. This knowledge audit is a tool or a technique that we go in and we, we decide on the scope, whether it's a department or the whole law firm or the whole uh, uh, pharmaceutical product development uh, uh, section, whatever it is, we decide on the scope and then we undertake what I call an inventory of the intellectual assets. What's going on there? Not only the gaps, because see the problem with the needs assessment, that terminology is that we're all, often talking about just the gaps, just what we're missing, but also there are bound to be some things that are being done well and that can be used as a model. It's being done well in this section, it can be used as a model in the, that section. So you build that up sort of, strengths. So we build and, up strengths yeah. and, and it's many times, oh I hate to give credit to somebody else, but it's many times just the good old SWOT analysis. Mm -hmm. We go in and we look at what the strengths are, what the weaknesses are, what the threats are, and what the opportunities are. Now those people who know me and my work in knowledge services, especially my work with strategic learning and KDKS, know that I am Mr. Optimism, I'm Mr. Look for the opportunities. And that goes back, of course, to my, my great mentor. My students, I think, sometimes get a little tired of hearing me talk about Peter Drucker. He was one of the greats in Amen. our management career. Absolutely, <laughs> yes, the, found, the founder of modern management. And Peter Drucker used to say, I heard him say it many times, that if we're going to be successful, our activities, our work must be opportunity focused and results focused. So I take from the SWOT methodology, okay, we want to do all four of those things, strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities. But I want to take those opportunities and I want to predict situational analysis, uh, environmental scanning, whatever you want to call it. I want to predict what the result's going to be. And then we're going to put that in our recommendations that we give to the client and we're going to say, here are our recommendations and here's your strategy about how to achieve, how to accomplish these. Okay, but back me up for a second. First of all, who is your typical, who, who calls you? Who, you the, the phone rings yep. at somebody who, who thinks they need this service. They, they, you tell me two things. Who is it typically? Is it a chief X officer or what's the X? And why is he or she calling you? What is the, okay. you know, Doc, it hurts here. Love it. What's the pain point? It hurts okay. when I do that. Well, yeah. then don't do that. <laughs> uh, my, okay. Quick, typically. Quick uh, and dirty, typical uh, uh, situation. I'm called by someone who has heard me give a speech or seen one of these or been to a conference where I was a speaker, not always a keynoter, but I'm, I'm around a lot at, at, at conferences. And they're not just 
information or library conferences or knowledge management conferences, there are oftentimes things like legal tech or uh, uh, one that's coming up now on, on information knowledge security, going to be here in New York in a few weeks. Uh, I'm typically at these things, oftentimes a speaker. So someone has heard me speaking. They don't call me immediately. But there is some issue in the organization that needs to be resolved. And here is a good example. I'm not going to name names. Mm -hmm. Management consultants can't name names. Uh, but uh, one of the, well, a typical situation was a company, big PR firm, called us and said, we were first out of the gate or among the first out of the gate with uh, our, our intranet, our corporate intranet, X number of years ago. Guess what? We've grown 10 times, we're still using the same tools, the same materials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What are we gonna do? They asked us, they talked around it, this someone in the organization had heard me give a speech, had read one of my books or something like that, got in touch with me, but also got in touch with some management folks and said, let's call them in for a conversation. So I went in with some of my team because I've got some people I work with some on these things. We had a conversation and the first thing we did was to say, well, first of all, if you're going to go for a new corporate intranet, stop thinking about it as an intranet. Think about it as your corporate KM system or your corporate mm -hmm. knowledge services system. Think about it in terms of how you and your organization can share what well, is, is with developed client. in your, with, with, with clients. With, it depends. Yeah. depends on the situation. Yeah. In this particular situation, it was all internal in like 17 countries. Mm -hmm. but. Many times, it's not only do we have these build up these big products, knowledge base of our, our reports and our documents and all that, but we've got uh, uh, clients out there that we share these with, or we give, or clients give us information. So it's very much the going back and forth. But knowledge mm -hmm. services leads into this whole business of here we go. It's like a broken record: knowledge development and knowledge sharing. KDKS you know, and being successful at it. Yeah, successful. you reminded me of something. There's there are debates uh, in within the competitive intelligence field, which is the field I really have spent most of my time in, uh, about the differences between competitive intelligence and knowledge management. Yes, and you may have heard these debates, and the the common wisdom is that well, competitive intelligence is about the outside and about the future. That's sort of the first thing you learn in the first hour of the first day about competitive It's about the outside world and the future. And knowledge management is about internal. And you just mentioned the word internal information. And I've always resisted that good for you. Uh, segmentation or siloization, but how would you react okay. to that? Good for you. Internal, external characterization. In knowledge services, when you're dealing with information management, knowledge management, and strategic learning, you're very much dealing with both. When you're talking about information management, specifically in IT, yeah, that's very internal. That's what's going on internally. But then you get to knowledge management, working with knowledge, it's not just the knowledge that we've captured here in our own databases and our own uh, integrated library systems and our own this or that uh, corporate knowledge uh, uh, services tool, that sort of thing. It's what we also know that we can go outside and bring in that's of value to us. And then the strategic learning piece says, okay, we're going to share that. We're going to we're going to learn it. We're going to not only be a learning organization, but a teaching organization as well. So, is it too much of a stretch to say to that jaded CFO of a Fortune <laughs> 500 company, you can actually? This is not a cost center. It's a it's a revenue. It could be a revenue stream. Could be. We'll create yeah. identify new revenue streams yeah. using this yeah. set of tools and yeah. technologies. Good. Well, there was actually that, a few years ago there was the whole concept of entrepreneuring where. Uh, uh, and I'm going to tell you a quick story about both sides of entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial uh, knowledge services. One of the companies with which we worked uh, uh, up in, I uh, forgot, Route 128 in, outside of Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, I've forgotten the name of the company or what it was specifically, a scientific organization. They were actually creating products within the organization that they actually sold to their customers. I mean, they had people who were, who were regular customers then they, as an added service for XDX thousands of dollars a year, we'll do this. Another company I know with whom I work, as a matter of fact, quite seriously, they create a a technical tool, techno a technical tool, a databases and that sort of thing, actually an integrated library system. But they also offer a training program or a, or a learning program, whereas if you sign up for our program, 
we will bring Guy St. Clair and the SMR team in to conduct in-house educational web a series or, or seminars or webinars for you on this subject or that surgery to help you get on board with whatever it is you're doing. Pretty common practice. Uh, and so we, there, there's a lot of that, that going on back and forth. So it is internal, it's external, and it's very much leading into the KDKS, the knowledge, uh, the uh, uh, strategic learning. Piece. So it's, 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 uh, it's training and technical assistance and, and that kind of thing. Well, not, not technical not, in the sense of using no. the technology, yeah. but technical in let us teach you about how we'll look at your environment. Mm -hmm. We might even do an environmental scan or a knowledge audit. Well, that's a little bit, uh, well, we might. We might do a knowledge audit. And then we'll say, this is what we've discovered, and this is what we recommend you do with this department. There are people over here who can help you do, do that. So we try, what is the term I'm trying to use here? It's very much pulling together uh, well, it's the whole sharing thing. Gosh, that gets very tiresome after a while, but that's, so, that's where we're going. But are there technology, you mentioned technologies in a couple of uh, cases, you know, library yeah. systems, that kind of thing. Are there a core set of technologies that you work with to implement? Is that is technology a key We don't piece ourselves. Of this? We don't ourselves. We work with partners, we, we work with partners yeah. and we look at what's internal. For example, uh, right now we're, worth an, we're looking at organizations. Uh, do we do we name names? Well, we can edit them out it's if up we don't you. want to. Yeah, we can edit. Uh, 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 an organization that had some real uh, uh, issues of transparency and uh, the word getting out amongst all the people that needed to have the information uh, for a particular product development situation schema, mm -hmm. and they lost a lot of time, a lot of money. It was just a very very cost costly situation, and somebody said, "Anybody ever heard of SharePoint?" Could we talk about SharePoint and what we might do here? Okay, there was a learning curve. There was a lot of stuff that had to go on, but they decided to go in that direction. And we, we didn't say you must go with SharePoint, but we said, look at, we, we interviewed and reviewed the situation and said, here's some things you need to think about. And then they came up with a series of things and then decided. Okay, well, that's another benefit then. It, where that was the case of where SharePoint was ena enabling a time to market yeah, uh, yeah, for absolutely, a product, absolutely. Which was not a knowledge product, right? I mean, you don't have to tell me what it was, but it was not. No. It was a product, no. product. Right. So that's a key benefit. Obviously, time to market in a strategic uh, context is very important. And cutting that. back on resource alloc a resource usage yeah. because you've got time and labor costs. Speed that's what the yeah, yeah, yeah. And cost and So you can yeah. say that at CFO. Yeah. Look what we've done. Now, oftentimes you have to do it first mm -hmm. and make a report that we saved XDX dollars, that sort of thing. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about, you talked, we talked about the field of knowledge services and we talked about your practice in knowledge services. Yes. Now I want to talk for a little bit about the future of knowledge services Hot and where dog. this is all going. Okay. Um, Columbia, I think, is the first major university, correct me if I'm wrong, in the, in the world really training in knowledge management knowledge services. Is that a bellwether of things to yes. come? And if so, how do you see this evolving? How quickly will this evolve? Is it picking up steam? Is it getting corporate attention, corporate resources? Is the federal governments, I know some federal governments, not the US, I think, but you know, are interested in this. And uh, there's actually something actually, called the, the knowledge is, agencies. Yes, and your company. In Portugal, absolutely. is no, the, the oh. knowledge agency is a, is, is a government agency in, Port, in Isn't Portugal. That interesting. No okay. relationship to us, but I just ran across it in one of our searches. But um, so, is it picking up momentum? Where do you see it heading in the next, say, three to five or even ten years? Oh wow, I love questions like that, and I love <laughs> this particular one anyway because I'm at the point in my career where I'm spending a lot of time thinking about where we've been and what's going to be happening in the future. So let me uh, dust off my crystal ball here and talk a little bit about uh, how things are happening. Yes, I am very much involved with Columbia University. The program we have, it's a graduate program. It is the Columbia University School of Continuing Education, and it is the Master of Science in Information and Knowledge Strategy. Now you say, wait a minute, knowledge, information and knowledge strategy? Who cares about strategy for this sort of thing? Well, lots of people do. Our company's research and what's, gone, what's been picked up at Columbia and what we've studied over the last several years before we created this program three years ago is that managements and leaders, enterprise leaders and organizations, Tim, they're very aware that they have discrete, what I call discrete functions. They've got research management areas. They've got uh, records coordinators and records managers. They've got archives. They've got database builders. They've got, but they've got, and they've got all of these areas 
having to do with information management, knowledge management, and strategic learning, our knowledge services definition. But they've got all these discrete areas. You can get, even get a PhD in specialized librarianship or a PhD in some of these fields. That's fine. But guess what? From the point of view of the business management of the people who are running this organization, there's no strategy for how you pull it all together. And this is when Guy goes into his umbrella routine. There has to be some way to pull it all together. So what we're doing at Columbia is we're teaching about how to take the basic principles, Mr. Drucker on, the basic principles of management, of leadership, and of strategy and pulling them together in what we're calling the knowledge domain. And in fact, I teach a course called that, called Management and Leadership in the Knowledge Domain. And what we're trying to do is to teach people to come out as knowledge strategists. They can go out back to their jobs or they can go looking for new jobs and they can say, here I am, I have, had, I have this master's degree, I know how to do a knowledge audit, I know how to design a knowledge strategy for the larger organization. So that's happening at Columbia University. Now don't get me wrong, there are 46 universities and, and, and institutions around the world teaching knowledge management. Some of them give graduate degrees, PhDs. There are many organizations teaching information science, library science, it can be uh, uh, undergraduate, graduate, or PhD level work. There are even commercial organizations like SMR International that provide a lot of training either in-house for corporate, corporate and organizational clients or quite frankly just we go out and we do it and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in just a second. So there is a lot going out but guess what? No one but Columbia is offering this graduate program in strategy in going to our, your managers in your company or your organization and say, you know what? It's wonderful that we've got this research unit or that we've got this archives unit, but they don't talk to each other. They're all specialists. How can we make them talk together? And that's what our company built up its reputation doing in various countries around the world, in the United States and Canada and various parts of Europe and, and just all over the place, Africa, Australia, New Zealand. We are known as going into an organization and developing a knowledge strategy for that organization. So that's how we've pulled all this, the strate strategy piece together for Columbia University and, for, and, it's, and the, we, we invite people to apply, We're very, we, we mix or we combine the professional piece of going out and working in the marketplace with Columbia's, of course, reputation for academic excellence. It's a tough 16 months but it's very worthwhile. Now beyond that, you say, okay guy, you run a consulting organization, you go out and you do, you do creating, uh, helping organizations create or develop a knowledge strategy. Absolutely. And my team does quite a bit of that. What's happening with Mr. Guy? What's Guy doing more than, I'm still doing the consulting, but I'm sort of like, you know, at that point in my career where I don't want to use the word MNL screed, but I'm that guy that people refer to. I've read your book, come and talk to us, and I'll come in and I'll bring one of my team. And basically, the on the ground work is usually done by somebody else. Why is that? Because I'm so caught up in the teaching. I'm loving what we're doing at Columbia. I also work for the Special Libraries Association. I have a team from SMR International and with the Strategic Alliance with that association, we have an annual series of six courses that are done and people can get certified by the association of having attended these programs and having learned from Guy and his team, SMR International and his team. And then of uh, equally of interest to I think many of the people who are with us today is SMR also has an, a, 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 a strategic agreement, strategic alliance with an organization called Sutron Global in San Diego, California. I've worked with these people for years and years and years in a lot of different uh, situations and we actually provide them with advice about knowledge services, how they can take it to their customers and yes, 
teaching. Once again, Mr. Guy gets in front of a camera and once a month delivers free webinars, half 30 minute webinars for our clients, SMR, uh, SMR's clients, for Glo uh, Sutron Global's clients. So my big push nowadays, am I writing more books? No. I write blog posts on our corporate uh, uh, site. Uh, am I uh, uh, doing a lot of consulting? Well, I kind of lead the team, but the ground, on the ground work is done by other, other people. Basically, I'm teaching. That's where I am nowadays. Okay. The students out of this new program, I realize the program is new. There may not be a whole lot of learning experience, but um, to the extent you do know, where, where will these people end up? In, in companies or in mm -hmm. government, and mm -hmm. what will they be doing? Are okay. you having recruiters come oh, yeah. to Columbia and say we want people, and if so, who is coming? Okay, uh, the, uh, they are, are, it's coming, well, Sorry, the, the, the background but there, the background, where, they where, they go, where yeah. they go, is all over the place. I mean, we have people from the, uh, from, from pharma, we have people from the financial community, we have people from uh, uh, what we call the glamour industries, fashion, media, all that sort of thing. We have people from the armed services. We have people from government agencies. You referred, uh, we were talking earlier about, uh, uh, is the, uh, the governments, uh, many governments are getting this whole knowledge thing. Uh, U.S. government is very, very strong in this area. A lot of work being done in this area, as is the U.S. military. We did a big project for the uh, uh, Air Force a few years back. There's a lot of this stuff going on. So yeah, it's all over the place. Where are these graduates going out, going to work? Okay. Hold me back here because basically you're not going to go on to Monster or you're not going to go in the New York Times want ads and see an advert saying wanted knowledge strategist. What we're teaching is a way of working that is then applied in, okay, we've got somebody who needs uh, 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 to be the head of uh, technology management for XYZ Corporation or even, even the associate head or the deputy head, something like that. If that person who's applying has a graduate degree in knowledge strategy, they've dealt with things like intellectual property, uh, uh, all kinds of things, uh, uh, and, and business analytics, uh, my course, management and leadership, uh, metadata stuff. So they so they're going they're they're going into all sorts of different different, different units. Different. I, I read, yeah, I read the other day that twenty five percent, and I will not remember the source right now. Twenty five percent of CIOs of Fortune five hundred chief information officers. Mm -hmm do not have technical backgrounds. 20 years ago, that was unheard of. They mm -hmm. all had technical backgrounds, mm -hmm. I think to their detriment. Mm -hmm. And now that more are not having technical, technical backgrounds but understand the business and the business strategies, I mean, is it possible some of your people could end up being chief information officers? Oh, absolutely, they could yeah. end up being chief information officer. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of fantasizing that probably within five to seven years, we're gonna have people as chief knowledge officers, chief learning officers, or probably more specifically as this whole thing about knowledge strategy moves forward, and, and it is moving forward. Uh, all, the numbers are growing in all these teaching areas I just described. The numbers are growing all the time because management has now recognized how valuable it is, you see. So, so the numbers are growing. I think we're gonna probably see, if I'm fantasizing, uh, uh, but bear with me, I think in five, seven years, we're gonna probably see a chief knowledge strategist. We have chief strategist uh, uh, officers, so we may see a chief knowledge strategist in our I think at one point when I started in knowledge, uh, giving knowledge lectures, you know, 15 years ago, there there was a figure that about 20% of uh, Fortune 500s had some kind of chief knowledge officer, mm -hmm. and I think it's much below that now. Yeah, I think they, we had they, a big, they, we've they had a big sort of dip. Started in off we've with had it, a big and dip. they might be coming back to it. But uh, I guess this gets back to our earlier question is, and I'll, let you, I'll, I'll ask just a, 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 again in a broad sense, um, is what, why is that happening? Is it just stayed around long enough that people felt it was, it was w w worthwhile? Or is there's been something, obviously biz all businesses in the past five years have had a really extraordinary experience, this extraordinary worldwide prolonged mm -hmm. recession, depression, whatever you want to call it. Things have mm -hmm. been much tougher, uh, uh, career, uh, expectations have gone down, pricing has stayed very competitive, and we've all had a very tough in, uh, time in every industry. Does that have something to do with the fact that this is coming back, or, or are there other it factors? It is coming back, but there are other factors that are coming into play. And I think the biggest one I'm going to describe for you in terms of an analogy. Years ago, I won't tell you how many, I wrote a book. We didn't call it knowledge services, we called it information services. 
Uh, I wrote a book on TQM in information services. Big successful, big success. We were very pleased with it. Um, how many people nowadays do you hear talking about knowledge circles, TQM? Why? It's kind of, Why? Uh, well, I think it's because I've wondered the same thing and I've asked people the same thing myself and people say, well, it's kind of baked in now. It's just going to say, it's where I'm going to go. Yeah. It's what we do. Yeah. It's what we do. I, talked, I, I talk a lot about how, we've, how, how knowledge and sharing are now part of what we do. So if my partner is an SMR International hear this, or even my pals at Columbia or at Sutron or at SLA hear this, they may say, Guy, what's going on? Because I'm not so sure that X number of years down the road, we're going to hear people talking about knowledge services or even knowledge management, or even strategic learning, because it's going to be part of what we do. It's going to be a, 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 an element of the workplace. And guess what? If your daughter or son has, or yourself, or me, myself, we've gotten up to Columbia and we've gotten a, a, a master's degree in information and knowledge strategy, we're positioned to be in a leadership position where they're not talking about knowledge strategy or knowledge services or knowledge management, but we know it's there. Mm -hmm. It's part of how our corporation succeeds. So these people could actually be leaders of the corporations. They could be oh. C CIOs I or some no kind of CXOs. Problem with of, that. Of, and they could be positioned I, to be, say, board. I mean, uh, do you see any, any interest from board, people that run uh, boards of companies? Uh, I mean, when you talk about knowledge strategy, to me, strategy is about allocating resources, yeah, big resources over a long period yeah, of time. It's, so it's very specific. To, 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 has this reached a board level issue, or do you predict that it will reach the board level issue, where boards say yes. all this stuff, data, glut, and big data, and all these things, they're either huge threats or huge opportunities. We as a board of this Fortune 500 company we need to, start need to pay attention yeah. to this. We I, to I wish I, could, I had done the research, and I wish I could give you some specific names and names. I can't. What I can say is that from my readings and my observations, yes, we're seeing this. Um, for one thing, our company wouldn't be called in to help an organization develop a knowledge strategy with all that that entails, because that usually is not just Guy coming in. It's, we, it's a team of people, and it's, it, it's, it, they're going to put some resources into this. It may not go totally to the board, but when there is, for example, I was working with an organization just a couple of years ago, and there was a governing board meeting. And the uh, uh, CIO, not CIO, the chief executive officer of the uh, CE, CEO of the organization actually invited me to give a presentation about what we were doing in developing a knowledge strategy. And people were, okay, I tend to get a little bit uh, uh, embellishing in when I'm telling a story, but people were standing and cheering. I mean, members of this governing board were saying, why haven't we done this sooner? And you know, let's do more of this and let's have it. And we had a town meeting for the whole, or you know, blah, blah, blah. It just went on, just it was very exciting. I think we're going to see much more of that sort of thing. In fact, I think we are seeing more of that sort of thing. Yeah, I guess as a business person, I should take my team and we should go out and get some specifics and maybe write an article or something because we need to, to that's a very, very good thing to be thinking about. What's happening at the board level? Now, it's happening in organizations. Boy, it's happening in lots of organizations, AIIM, uh, SLA that I've already mentioned, quite a few organizations and academic organizations, educals and things like that. But I wish I could, yeah, you've given me an idea. We're going to do some thinking about what's going on in corporate boards. Yeah, I think that uh, knowledge management and your, your, your uh, comment about the name, I think maybe the positioning, this is my own two cents and so we can edit this later, but uh, is people tend to think of it, because I use it, name my company, the knowledge agency. People say, Tim, don't you think that's kind of academic? People think academia when they think of knowledge. And they haven't seen it as you, I'm sure, and I, and anybody that's read Drucker see it as the, Very the fourth, it's the the fourth resource, land, labor, capital, a la Adam Smith, and then knowledge, which knowledge. Adam Smith didn't really Good talk for you. about. Good for you. And it's a key corporate resource, and I think that uh, companies may be, maybe the name has... Okay, I will tell you that. I've been, I've been doing this long enough that I've seen the shift. 
Yes, there were, as I mentioned, as, as I've described to you in other circumstances, there are, were plenty of times when I would go in to talk to in, uh, enterprise leaders or managers, senior management, and I would have to spend the first half hour trying to explain to them, as lay people from our perspective, what this whole thing of knowledge attention is all about, what the knowledge domain is, because it's something we do every day. We all deal with knowledge every day. It's not, a, it's not that big a deal. But when it's, when it's not dealt with properly and it's costing the company or the organization money or resource, then you gotta be looking at it. So what I think has happened in terms of the academic thing, and boy did I used to hear that a lot. Guy, why don't you get practical? You sound like you're actually uh, uh, delivering a PhD thesis or something like that. No, I'm not. We're talking about what's going on nowadays in the business community, and we're hearing more and more people comfortable with knowledge management, big data, in information technology, technology management, all these things we're talking about because they're part of our everyday life now. 15 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, to say to Joe Blow, corporate manager, uh, let's talk about how knowledge is shared in your organization, you wouldn't, he wouldn't even stay, he or she wouldn't even stay for the conversation. But that's all changed now. That's terrific, and uh, I think that's a good way to, to wrap up. This has been a fascinating conversation uh, with Guy St. Clair, president of SMR International, and a leader, really a pioneer, I might even say, of knowledge services and knowledge management. Guy, thanks so much and really appreciate your conversation Thank you, and Tim. your friendship too. Thank you. Thank you. We'll sign off now. Tim Powell from the Knowledge Agency. This is the what we're calling the IntelliJam, uh, conversations with leaders in business, business thinking, uh, business strategy, and especially organizational intelligence and knowledge. Thanks and see you again soon. Yeah.